Coming up, following the third straight loss since the injury to Kevin Durant, we discuss where the panic meter stands for the Brooklyn Nets fan base, if this should be inspiring Sean Marks to make a significant move in the February deadline, and whether or not, quite frankly, this team only is as good as Kevin Durant. You are Locked On Nets, your daily Brooklyn Nets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Ah, yes, my friends, it is the Locked On Nets podcast right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team, the Brooklyn Nets, every single day. Over there, you're going to find Doug Nori. He's the owner-operator of DFSR. For all your daily fantasy sports rankings from DraftKings to FanDuel, he's got you covered. I'm Adam Arbrick, breaking down the New York football giants on the One Giant Podcast with my boy Andy Mack. We thank you for making us your first listen of the day. We're free on all those great platforms. And Doug, I just took a sip of extremely hot tea. How are we, sir? Oh, not so great. I mean, this was the, supposed to be a, the easy part of the schedule. This was the soft landing for the Nets after the Kevin Durant injury. This was supposed to be the let's not panic because this team's built fine and they're constructed to be deeper and it's not all about Kevin Durant. And man, have they done everything in the in these first three games to make you start thinking about walking back those feelings if you haven't already done it, which I wouldn't be shocked if some people have. Yeah, so yesterday after the post game, obviously, uh, against the Spurs, I, I focused in on the game, things that worked or didn't work, some of the issues that I maybe had with the way Jacques Vaughn handled coming out of halftime. But on a high level, we're going to talk about the panic meter here. We're also going to talk about the roster construction and where we thought we felt about them. And ultimately, if something needs to get done here by Sean Marks in order to kind of buoy the spirits. Now, panic meter wise, so if you follow us uh, over on YouTube, our post-game lives, we do the episode, and then we also stick around. And in there, Doug, I was asked about scale of 1 to 10, where am I on the panic meter? And I thought, I actually, I, I stay pretty positive. Just in the old, now talk to me in one more game. You were watching this one. Where are you on the 1 to 10 scale? Um, Long-term, I- I'm pretty low, but that's only because this team was only ever going to be as good in the like playoffs and championship as Kevin Durant. So I, and, and that's, you know, that's not on the table right now because he's going to come back and this isn't like a major injury. So I think long-term I'm not really that panicky short term, which I think we've always run parallel tracks and how we think about the nets, right? Like regular season playoffs. Like we think about them kind of always have had to think about them in two separate ways. Short term. I am a little concerned that the first three games have looked not great. I do think there's context here that mm-hmm. makes you, that makes my panic meter not rise all the way up, but it's higher than it. It's certainly higher than when Kevin Durant was first injured, when my panic meter was low, it was like, okay, they're fine. They're built for this. This is good. Or it's not, excuse me. It's not good. This is going to be okay. Like the team is made to sort of withstand a, an injury to their superstar. They have not done anything to disprove. They, they've not done anything to help along those lines. So I can go into some of the context I think is, but like, does that make sense? I, it's like yeah. not, it's not a 10, but it's certainly like, hey, this was the Thunder and the Spurs and more of the Spurs too. I mean, like yeah. th- these were supposed to be somewhat easier games or sort of scheduling luck. And it just hasn't worked out that way. Yeah, and I think, listen, 13-win team coming in, 14 after they beat the Nets for the San Antonio Spurs. And there's things within that game that I talked about didn't like. It's really hard to sit there and watch a guy like Johnson go off for 36 points and really have somewhat easy access. Now, I think, not to steal any of Doug's thunder, and I I mentioned this in the postgame a little bit too, it's, well, it's been three games, but you didn't have Ben Simmons. You know, played Boston, then you don't have Ben Simmons, then you don't have Kyrie Irving. So... The adjustments that Jacques Vaughn, if he had this plan in mind about how am I going to approach not having Kevin Durant, well, it starts to get a little bit weirder when you don't have Ben Simmons for a game and then you don't have Kyrie for a game. I still don't think, and I said this before last night's game, that was still a game that you should have won, even without Kyrie Irving. You could have told me Ben Simmons didn't play, and I still would have said you should win that game. But that's why I think the same thing with you where I say, oh, I'm a four on a scale of one to ten. Why? Because give me at least give me two or three more games here to see how they perform. And we did kind of say coming into this stretch, while we don't want to fall 
completely down the standings, which they've already tumbled to four here pretty quickly and will fall to five behind Cleveland in short order. But I, I want to see how they're playing. And it's hard to get that sample size yet. We haven't had the full team together here, minus Kevin Durant, obviously. Right. So that's the context. It's that even it's been no Kevin Durant plus no Kyrie plus no Simmons. Like they haven't played. And then the one game they had them all together was the game against Boston. And that is what it is. But now Boston's a tough team. So it's like hard to take too many takeaways from that one. But yeah, no, it's it's that part. It's that you're missing your best player and then you're missing, you know, for the Spurs game, you're missing your second best best player also. And then the game before you're missing sort of the exact guy you needed against a team like the Thunder and Simmons. And so yeah. having it not all come together in terms of relative health around the other guys is certainly not helping them here. Again, the Spurs are about the, as bad a team in the NBA as there is. Like they had the worst yeah. point differential. They are missing their arguably best player in Devin Vassell. And so... I mean, he's been out for a while now, and this is a team that kind of on a functional level wants to lose games. Like they play their starters low minutes frequently, like they'll run a bunch of different rotations because that's just I think there's been an organizational directive to like see what we have with some of the young guys. Try yeah. not to win. Right. Like because mm -hmm. we're in the Wembenyama sweepstakes here. And so to lose to a team like that, even with Kyrie out and it looked like not that close at times is. Yeah is 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 a troubling sign and again i'll always go back to the idea of w without kevin durant there's th there's no huge upside for the team anyway because that's just how every team is when they lose their best player <laughs> no team has uh, as high end upside when you lose your best player but i, I will say you would have liked to see more resolve I, the, there was it was super sloppy they yes. just had a, a ton of problems we can talk about simmons i think there was good and bad stuff there for sure um, but I, I think it's just more that it's that I think when you're a fan or when you're watching the games, you're just hoping for a little bit more from a group of players that probably at that point is around the same talent level as the Spurs, mm -hmm. right? Like at that point, because the Spurs, again, they don't have really anybody. Jakob is going to get traded almost, like for, almost for sure. Kellen Johnson's fine. Trey Jones like might be something one day. I mean, this team is just not. There's like not even there's a bright no, future for the yeah, Spurs. Like I yeah. can't even. I can't even be okay with it on the Thunder side because like, hey, the Thunder are out exceeding expectations. They have a true superstar in SGA. They have a really rising talent in Josh Giddy. They played super hard. Like they're around 500. Even with the Thunder, I was willing to probably make some more concessions. But the Spurs mm -hmm. one does really land you in a like head scratching moment about the team and it could just be one game, but there's definitely, or, or it could be signs of just, you know, more brutal things. Yeah. And that's why coming up here in a second, I, I do want to look at, cause we saw, I saw a lot of this in the post game conversation with fans around certain players on the Nets team. So I want to tap into roster construction, the guys that were added in, why there's limitations there and why some of the players that were here from last season are going to be severely hindered by the absence of Kevin Durant. All right, before we get into that, got to tell you about our friends over at Built Bar. If you're looking for a delicious treat, it's post-holiday. Maybe your post-holiday food. You're trying to get back on the healthy track. You're looking for something you can grab and go, but you want to check a couple boxes. You need to make sure the taste is there, and you want to make sure the nutritional stats are there as well. Check and check when it comes to Built Bar. The flavors, churro, peanut butter brownie, coconut almond, and then the stats. 130 calories, just 4 grams of sugar, 17 grams of protein, which you don't, won't even believe when you get them because because they're completely covered in 100% real chocolate. So you're getting the great taste, you're getting the great flavors, and you're getting all the nutritional stuff to back it up. You can grab them now at built.com, or you go to Walmart, you go to Sam's Club, they have them there as well. You grab four boxes of cookies and cream, the double chocolate, coconut puffs, you grab those. Basically, at all those big box stores, also at built.com. If you're uh, headed to Sam's Club, run and grab a 13-bar box of the uh, brownie batter. You can grab that churro, like I said. You can thank me later on that. Or you can go to built.com. Okay, so here's the thing coming out of this game that I thought was pretty glaring as well. And we talked about this when we said, who's going to fill in the lineup without Kevin Durant? Now, there's two players that I want to focus in on um, just from a, purely from the game standpoint. So TJ Warren looks really good. TJ Warren isn't going to play more than about 24, 25 minutes right now. It's going to build up. 
but you can't expect him to go and play 30 minutes. So when I looked back at this and thought, gee, when you look in the second quarter and it's TJ Warren and it's Edmund Sumner and a little bit of Cam Thomas that helps get you back to almost even with the Spurs, why not lean into that that much sooner? But we talked about on the front end. You put TJ Warren in the starting lineup, all of a sudden the minutes become that much deeper, that much more quickly. So that's the one piece, Doug. But the other one was Seth Curry. And what I'm going to say is, is like he gets hurt, obviously. I actually went and looked at the on-off numbers with him and Kyrie Irving. It's not great. And the team overall, offensively and defensively, has a better net rating on both ends of the floor when Curry is not out there. And I do think that in last night's game specifically, we got that extra sample of, I don't think Curry knows how to turn on that other part of his game, which is being a little more balanced, you know, getting people into some good positions. I think that he leans into it. We talk about Kyrie, hero ball. I got to go get my shots and make mine. You saw him get swallowed up a lot in this game in and around the basket. It just wasn't effective. His stat line looks a lot better because he came on a little bit late in that fourth quarter. But for the most part, this is why I've been banging the drum around. I think Seth Curry is like the guy that you would kind of circle as being the movable piece if you're going to do something because he, there's, there's this limited functionality. For as good as he is offensively, he's built like Joe Harris is in a lot of ways to play off of the superstars. He's not there to help carry a load like this. Yeah, if Seth Curry's taking the most shots on your team, your team's probably in trouble. Um, and that is was the case. On I don't think that's that's not even an anti Curry take as much as just a you know a, a rational basketball take. If Seth Curry leads your team in usage, your team has major major problems. Right? He's a good player for what he does. Um, he has there are limitations on his game for sure. They probably needed him to take about this many shots in this game because he's one of the few guys outside of Warren and we can get to Cam Thomas, I guess, shortly. But outside of those guys that can create their own shot off the dribble, like at, at some point with this with this roster, once there's no Durant and once there's no Kyrie shot creation um, when you're one on one with a defender there's really these other guys can't do it. Right. And so even against the Spurs. So Curry actually has that in his bag, but he doesn't have it. Like, I mean, I know it was only 16 shots, but that's because the minutes got limited a little bit here. He easily could have got up 20 in this game. And if that's happening, your team's in real trouble. I I don't really know what else to say. He could have probably run a little better on at the three point line. A couple of them were were okay looks that didn't go down sort of a theme for the nets uh, in general over these last couple of games. But I, I just think this is sort of the expectation around Curry. I don't even think it's anti Curry. Again, it's just that it's just that what are you really asking for from from him? Now, from a trading point of view, I agree with you that he's probably somewhat expendable at some point. He's not going to yeah. play big playoff minutes. Um, he's can be exposed specifically in this lineup that is also going to have Kyrie because you're going to have trouble point of attack defense. I do wonder what you would even get back from him because the teams, I I just don't know what his overall league value is at this point. He's a little older playoff teams aren't going forward, nor are they trading away functional pieces. So I Mm -hmm. think like with the nets, they get put into this tricky spot around even guys that have maybe some value. It's kind of the not right kind of value. And, (laughs) and that's, and, and that's where I land with Curry too. And so while, I mean, what I love, what I like to get, trade Curry for someone that was maybe a little more defensive oriented and could not have to take shots to be his primary, you know, skill set probably, but I just think, I don't know if those players exist on a team that would want to bring a guy like Curry at his age back. Yeah. And it's, it's funny too. Cause I, I, I am, I'm using Seth Curry as the tent pole. And by the way, when you talk about trading, it's like the nets are going to be looking for teams that are jettisoning players and not necessarily going to take back a Seth Curry. And because, and these well, you have to attach, here. maybe you'd have to attach something else to it. Like yes. a pick, like this is yep. what I mean. Yep. Like you're, and he's, and his salary, honestly, his salary is not even great for salary matching. And so it's like, it just gets into this weird, it just, cause like someone that's looking to unload, offload a bad contract cause they're not c- contending. It's like not Curry's right. contract's not helpful in bringing that money back. It's not right. He does. Cause, cause actually he's a kind of a good deal. <laughs> like he's kind of a good deal for what he is, which Good deals are good deals when you have them. Sometimes good deals aren't good deals when you're trying to trade them because mm-hmm. it, it, because because of the salary matching concerns in the NBA, you don't you can't send enough money back for a, a sort of dead contract somewhere else. And I, I don't know. It's just it, there's in such a weird spot with him. I I really want to be so clear. I'm not anti Curry here. It's just that like the way the team is constructed, it's just everything about the net starts to get a little bit weird. 
Well, and that's so one of the, this is what I drilled down on, right? So this is Seth Curry. And again, for the most part, this is not, it's not an anti Curry take. It's just a reality take, but the team with him on the court is a plus 1.37. They're a plus 4.37 when he's off. That's with everybody with Kevin Durant playing and everyone playing. So there's a discrepancy there. And I said before, they are a better offensive and defensive net rating team when Curry's off the court. Now, again, there's an insanely different value when it comes to having Kevin Durant and having those perimeter shooters. What, what I also found interesting was the non KD minutes with Kyrie Irving. So Royce O'Neal plus 1.71 plus 5.02 for Warren. That's 130 minutes and 251 for O'Neal. Even Patty Mills, which I put a big chuckle next to plus 14.33. So that means Patty should be in the starting lineup. As we all know, that's 79 minutes, but Joe Harris and Seth Curry, uh, Curry is actually a minus 0.54. Joe Harris, a minus 5.17. And the point, really the point being here to get off of Curry is Joe Harris is built the same way. He is a spot up shooter built to live off of spacing and crush triples around these superstars. And he struggled during this year. That minus five is substantial for Joe Harris right now. But you mean like the 17 like, minutes with over three and no points. <laughs> That well, by the way, so let's so let's let's so we're talking about this construction here a little bit, and this is something <laughs> that I think is also worth bringing up when it comes to Jock Vaughn, because in this game, so we can talk about the guys that played well, and, and some of them are the, the acquisitions, the Sumners and the Warrens of the world. However, I I don't know what the answer would have been, and I said as much in the post game yesterday because you're limited with who you can put in there. But if you're going to have Joe Harris in the starting lineup. You better be finding ways to get him shots because otherwise you're running an empty position. Like you might as well be running an empty position. And I know like you can, we can say with everything that's gone on around this team, Claxton going out early with the fouls really disrupts a lot of stuff too. But also three shots. He only ends up playing 17 minutes They take them out and they go a different direction. It's the smart thing to do as a coach. But if you make the commitment to that starting lineup, then you also have to make the commitment. This goes, does go back to Curry of like, Sharing is caring. We got to continue the ball movement. This is where you want the team to lean back into the fundamentals without the superstars. And seemingly it ended up being some Ben Simmons run, which was some positive, some negative, as you said. And then like just a lot of disjointed, not really knowing. And that, that was surprising to me from a coaching standpoint. You feel like you'd be drilling down and, hey, stick to what we know, ball movement. This is the San Antonio Spurs. We should still be able to win against them. And they didn't seem to have that plan in place, at least in the first quarter. And then again, in the third quarter, a combined 32 points in the first and third quarter. That is like borderline criminal against the Spurs. Yeah, Harris, uh, Harris uh, stunk. I don't know. I yeah. wouldn't be shocked if, he, if we heard something creeped up with like an injury here, like 17 minutes. I'm not making an excuse. He was bad. And he's been bad. Look, he's been shooting poorly all season. He's coming back from ankle stuff. Um, maybe at that point, you know, we're past the, we're past the timeline on being able to use that as an excuse. Like the shooting has not been there. He's significantly below his career marks at 37%. He's tanking his trade value, probably long-term if they're trying to think about has him. The money he just, value. Yeah, like, has cause the he money actually value. has, a, he actually has a contract. You could start matching. Um, and he's tanking his own value here because he can't make any shots. And that's like the one thing that he was supposed to be, or I mean, has been elite at in the past 37% just absolutely doesn't cut it from a spot up shooter. Um, um, who's yep. well over 40% for his career. The Harris thing is problems. I mean, this is what these are the these are the things that cascade toward how you lose to the Spurs. It's like Curry gets your most shots, Harris plays 17 minutes and doesn't can't make doesn't sing, do a single other thing basically <laughs> <laughs> on the court. Um like essentially runs cardio for 17 minutes and like you're going you're going to lose. And look, these guys are always going to benefit from having the superstars out there. Their skill set is still really aligned with playing with these other guys like space and shot creators and guys that can, you know, their gravity, at least around the three point line is still there. Even with bad numbers that does help guys like Kyrie. And it does help guys like Durant. But again, if they can't do those things and they're both shooting under their career averages, like what are we talking about here? Uh, we're, they, we're, they're in, we're in for a world of hurting. And so I, this, these are the things that like the actually it's more these things when I talk about panic, it's more these things that I sort of like low level panic on. <laughs> it's not like the short term loss to, to, the their, to their cards, right? Playing to their exactly. Stats, it's right? not the, the loss of the Spurs. There's almost a certainty in two weeks we will have forgotten about it because it will be some other problem that we're worried about or that's gotten better <laughs> and like whatever. That's just like sports are sports and like things just tend to have a stuff like this tends to burn out hard and bright, but. 
My low level concern is like stuff like this. Like if Harris can't shoot threes, he can't play. If Curry, you know, like if Curry's taking your most shots, your team's like sort of in trouble. I don't know. So, I mean, I want to talk to Simmons. I want to talk Cam Thomas too a little bit here, but uh, these are with the panic meter. I'm more worried about this stuff because they're maybe not good enough to play and they're not good enough to trade. And at that point, like you're in a really weird spot if you're the Nets. Let's talk about Ben Simmons. Let's talk about Cam Thomas. And also, uh, I'll give an explanation as to why the thing that the Brooklyn Nets need right now most in the absence of Kevin Durant is not another score. We dive into that next. All right. Before we get into that, going to tell you about our friends over at betonline.net, your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. BetOnline's got you covered. Now, last night, going into the game, when Kyrie Irving was out, but our friends over at BetOnline, they got the line down, still minus three and a half in favor of of the Nets, it looked like. Although I was starting to feel a little, starting to feel a little worried about that when I saw it, I was like, I don't know, this might be a Spurs game when it came to the money line. BetOnline.net, it's got you covered for all of your betting needs. They got podcasts as well. They got every sport. So if you're rolling through the NFL playoffs, make sure you head over there. If you're into NBA every night, you want to get some futures in there too. NBA's got you covered over at BetOnline. It's the fastest and easiest way. To get all of that betting info, head on over to the website today to, or on your mobile device to learn more. Bet Online where the game starts. Okay, so um, let's talk about Ben Simmons because I do want to get your take coming out of this game. We said he needs to be more aggressive, needs to take the shots. My summation was just, was it pretty? No, but is that the first step in getting better at this other thing? Yes. So he gets the 10 shots off. He goes for a triple-double. Um, what did you What did you like from that game against the Spurs? And then specifically, it's funny with, I, I will say I did have a, a, another thought about one Nicholas Claxton when he went out early with the fouls and then when he was able to get back in the action in the third. Well, it's hilarious because he actually did in a lot of ways the exact thing that you want him to do, which is get super aggressive around the rim early. Um, I think it's for I think he took it to the rim for two of the first four possessions or something like that. Uh, definitely the first possession because he got it in transition and back down a smaller defender right away. And I was like, okay, here we go. This is it. <laughs> um, and he did try to remain aggressive uh, throughout, I mean, at least at times throughout the game, but then it kind of, that starts to wane a little bit. I still get concerned that when the results aren't there for him early, he sometimes tries to starts to get away from, from try, like, sort of defaulting into that mode. They, they were plus with him on the court. You know, they were plus three with him when he played. So it's hard to put it all on Simmons here. It's funny with him because on the one hand, okay, so when he came out early in the game, I was like, yes, exactly. This is what he needs to do. Jacques Vaughn had some interesting quotes about him. I, I, maybe we'll save those for another podcast, but there were a couple things that ha did actually have me a little head scratching around, around this. If we have time, we'll get to it. But I was like, okay, this is exactly what I want to see. He's coming back from back surgery. I think it's all, all this is on the table for what, like what can be part of the Ben Simmons discussion. Yeah. I will say when he has the ball and he's going to the rim, if you had never seen it before from him and this was, you, you just got dropped down from space and this was your first time watching Ben Simmons play basketball. Mm hmm you would be curious about what was going on with his with his offensive game when he tries to get around the rim because it looks very uncomfortable. Like it looks, it does not look fluid. It looks hesitant even when he's aggressive. Yeah. Like it, the finishing and the touch around the rim has not come back yet. Some of that just could be he hasn't done it enough. <laughs> like sometimes you just need to do stuff a lot <laughs> to yeah. actually have it look better. That's like anything in the world. That's why I'm such an excellent lover. So I actually think in some ways his offensive game to me is predicated on I've seen him do it in the past and I'm waiting for it to come back. I think the current version has not happened again, back surgery, injury, other stuff going on. Yeah. The guy's got stuff going on here for sure. So I, while at this one hand, I was encouraged by the attempts at least early in the game. It's still difficult to be encouraged by the way it looks. Cause it does not look good. I'm still willing to have it look bad. It should, it should, it, it sometimes has to look really bad before it yep. can get better. Um, and that's just like almost again with almost anything in the world. Um, so I would hope that he goes out next game and gets double digit shots up again, even if Kyrie's back, like they need this to happen. They absolutely have to have him feeling really confident, but I'm still just two minds about Simmons's game. And look, he was plus on the on, uh, overall for the game. And, and it's hard to argue with the plus minus when we want to use that specific stat uh, for something that we want to prove. Yeah, of course. Now, the one, just a quick note on Nicholas Claxton is, I mean, as of right now, in this moment, he's the third best player on this team. And you can see the clear oh, contrast yeah, yeah, yeah. when he was off the court with his wife. And we said this before, but it's just it's such a great reminder. If he doesn't pick up those early fouls, I think this game goes dramatically different because you saw 
how he was able to really instill kind of his will on the offensive end and getting some finishes. Can I and say something about that? With fourth those blocks. Go ahead. Yeah. So this is this actually goes to my parallel track about the Nets too, right? Claxton, I agree with you for this season has been the Nets' best third best player. If the, Claxton is your third best player, your team also has a limited ceiling. I think mm -hmm. like, I, and so, and I think that your team probably can only go so far. Ben Simmons has a ceiling where if he is your third best player, you can win the championship. Like, so there's like this okay. two, there's two things that so are you going think on third, here. Nicholas Claxton, your third best player, the Nets cannot win the championship. Probably not. Okay. Like yeah, probably yeah, not because yeah, yeah. they just need this. They need this other thing. Like they need this other thing, which by the way, is exactly what a perfect version of Simmons does. Like they need this. So a version of Simmons that is at his like peak. And I don't mean like shooting threes and stuff like that. I just mean like back to sort of what he was doing before getting right. to the rim, looking really confident, really on offense. I think his confidence is there on defense. I'm actually not worried about that part at all. It's the offensive piece only. If we get like two months into this and two more months from now and we're, we're, the more time we clear away from the back surgery and he's able to like get back to like a full bill of like um, mental and physical health. I think mm -hmm. the, the third, a, a version where he is their third best player is championship caliber. Right. He's just not there no right now. So as long until, him. until yeah. we see that toggle until we de de definitively see that toggle, I think, I think we have to set our, our sights sort of in a limited fashion. Okay, so let, let's save the quotes around Ben Simmons because we'll talk about that um, on tomorrow's episode and we'll go a little bit deeper. There were some comments also from Nicholas Claxton around comparing last year to this year and being in the middle of a struggle now without Kevin Durant. The other thing then to me is this, and I'll tie it back to talking about Seth Curry, whether or not this team needs to make a move. I said everyone or there was a lot from the fan base saying you got to go out right now and get yourself a high-end third scorer. I disagree with that. Not because not because you couldn't use it, but because if you if we know that Kevin Durant is coming back and you know Kyrie is a part of this team, it still goes back to the same thing. You need to be getting a defensive-minded, table-setting guard with a little bit of length. Because if you had a guy like that in this game, he would have been able to set up Seth Curry rather than Curry being on ball. Get some looks for Joe Harris and, again, also give you some value in the backcourt defensively. But inside of that, and it's something we'll talk about going forward, when it comes to the trade deadline, I do scratch my head now about, and they said this on the broadcast, Richard Jefferson said this on the broadcast last night. Cam Thomas is buried just behind the Seth Curry's and even the Patty Mills of the world and the Edmund Sumner's, however you're constructing your backcourts. I don't know if I get it. And it's not because you and I have talked about Cam. I think he has a lot still to develop in his game, but he is as valuable as a Patty Mills or as a Seth Curry, at least in terms of what your functionality is to a full strength team for the, for the full strength roster for this team. So like there is the world where I'm like, Hey, clear out the guys that are, that aren't having great seasons or in the way a little bit. I don't think Patty Mills is going anywhere, but I think Seth Curry can. And I think that Cam Thomas at least seems like he's deserving of getting some run here because he does show up and give you an offensive game. Every single time that he's been given the chance. It doesn't mean the defense doesn't struggle, but I'll give you this. I think that he's looked better defensively. Not great. He's looked better than he did when he first came into the league. Seth Curry is not improving defensively. Cam Tom, there's another one of those like guys that could have upside. I wonder if the Nets are throttling the needle between giving him an opportunity or giving small showcase samples to put him into a package if they think they need to make a move. Yeah, it looked good last night. I mean, 30 yeah. minutes, like he was easily the only guy that felt really, really comfortable trying to score. Um, uh, it, the good, and that's the, the contrast between him and Curry. Sorry, that's the contrast. Like Cam Thomas is a downhill attack, go at the basket and score. Curry, we said, can do those things. He is a three-level scorer, but it's not. that's not his default mechanism, whereas that's what Cam well, is built to do. It's funny because I actually don't think Cam is a three-level scorer because he can't shoot threes. Yeah. He's like a two, I should, he's, yeah. a, he's a, it's more of like a sure. two-level scorer that can get to the rim. He's, I mean, the three-point percentage has creeped up a little bit this year, 34%. That's a fair, that's a fair distinction. But, the, but, sample but, size but, is, the sample size sorry. is too small probably still for him. So I – um. So I, I would, I just, I, I'll, I'll say I wouldn't make a definitive statement one way or the other. Like my guess is at some point he pro he can shoot threes. It's just like, right. and it's gotten better, but I wouldn't call him bad, but I wouldn't call him good. Right. Well, so, let's frame it, yeah. Let me frame it this way. He as a two level scorer closer to the basket is more valuable potentially than a two level scorer, Seth Curry further from the basket. With yeah, the other I think it's funny. Like, I think it's funny. Cause like, again, this is, uh, I'll put these things up and maybe we'll get out of here on this. I'll put these things on parallel tracks as well. Regular season version of what you maybe need now from this team in this current version, probably Cam is what you yes. clearly like yes. last night is what you need more. 
when you have the other guys in the court, Cam is what you need less because yeah. you don't you a guy that needs the ball a lot is not going to function in a in a scheme that has Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving in it. Like you can't have there's only so many you know only so many balls to go around and like I know with the Harden thing we sort of joked about that but it was like oh but Harden actually is a facilitator. Like Cam mm-hmm. is not that. So I think with those guys he fits his fit is actually worse. Um it's with but like like last night against OKC where they just needed so, they needed someone to make create shots like it was actually way more valuable because yeah. they 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 actually needed that to happen so I don't know I think that sort of situation depending it'll be funny to see where interesting to see where it goes again I've been lower on Cam Thomas than than most but like last it's hard to argue with I, I do think there's like specific situations where it call he's called for yeah. um and this like a game like last night probably should have broken the glass a little earlier although he did end up playing 30 minutes Yeah, um, so the next episode when we come back, we'll talk about player quotes. We'll break that down a little bit. Dive in a little bit more to to the Cam Thomas and really the backcourt issue when we talk about some of these supplemental players you want to bring in and maybe what the Nets need to do going forward. All right, we're going to get out of here. Make sure that you subscribe over on YouTube. Appreciate everyone that's part of our push to 5,000 subscribers. We blew past 4,000 like it was nothing. We're on our way to 5,000. We're at 4,500 right and change right now. So be part of that group. Go hit lock, uh, subscribe to Locked On Nets over at YouTube. Make sure you set the alerts too so you know when we're going live. Subscribe to Locked On Nets on, on YouTube. I don't give up. I'm a plotter. People come and go, but I stay the course. Kevin Costner. Oh, one of the all-time great posts. John Dutton. My gosh, I was trying to think of his other characters, but now I'm just blanking. Um, Lieutenant Dan. Consi- Ru- no, Kevin Costner? Well, in, in, in Dancing with Wolves. Oh, yeah. I thought you meant Lieutenant Dan from Forrest Gump. No, you know, I was doing the guy on the on the wagon from, uh, you know, from uh, Dancing yeah, with Wolves. Yeah, but you sounded like voice. Forrest Gump that when um, he saw, yeah. when he yeah, saw we'll uh, what's his name, Gary Sinise. Um, <laughs> so that's an embarrassing moment for you. But that's okay. We're going to leave it in uh, because I'm not going gonna, gonna to extend this to make sure I don't do the outro until we get to make sure this stays all the way in. Mm-hmm. It's clean. Kevin Costner, not not in Forrest Gump and one of the all-time great poets. We will be back again tomorrow talking more Brooklyn Nets basketball.